why don't you guys come on up and we'll launch into a little Q&A. So Ariel, since I gave you such a um, uh, warm <laughs> introduction, do you want to talk just a little bit about um, uh, sort of what, what's up at Withings and this sort of transition from objects that were ugly to, to, to fashionable? <laughs> I'm allowed to like grill you at the same time, right? <laughs> I'm Ariel Carpenter. I'm the senior marketing manager for Withings in North America. And just to give a brief overview for those of you that aren't familiar with Withings besides what David spoke about, <laughs> um, we started about six years ago with um, two French engineer entrepreneurs who came out with the first connected scale. So you saw that up there. Um, and really, we were in the kind of quantified self and the just tech and connected space. Um, and where we are today is really different from that. We've moved into this ecosystem of connected healthcare devices where we see health represented in five pillars. So it's weight, activity, sleep, heart, and environment. And we see all of these pieces um, that you can find in all of our devices that we create. Uh, and it, it all really plays into how we can flip the funnel of healthcare and have patients or consumers be the ones that are in control of their own healthcare data and um, the ones that are really owning their own data and, and having all of those devices at home for them to track. So, you know, where we are today is we launched five products within the past year. And, um, you know, as, as David showed you, he's wearing one of our watches. And the Activité is really what we see as the new face of activity tracking. So uh, it? what it I'll is, pass, is pass, it's yeah. taking a face, um, the analog watch face that everyone really knows and understands, and embedding very discreetly uh, the activity tracker technology. So what we've tried to do with all of our devices is just make them really simple and elegant and easy to use. We want um, health tracking to be seamless. Uh, we want technology to just be really easy uh, in what you're doing. And, and I think that's really the essence of, um, the essence of our brand. Uh, and you know, just speaking about fashion, I think everyone, everyone really knows and understands that design can be important into you know, having something that's wearable or having something that's in your home. But what we're really finding is it's now really increasing the sustainability and the adherence of our products as well. So we've been able to show that people that use our wearable devices and our watch are actually walking more steps than, than those that don't. Um, people that, use our, that have our scale are actually stepping on the scale uh, at least once a month, one year or more after owning the scale. Uh, so, you know, we have the data now to show that design and fashion is really important in this space. And I, I think you'll see more and more coming from us uh, in terms of how we feel we can really change um, connected healthcare. Do you, um, I'll let people go down and, and talk about a little bit about their thing, but just to follow up on the more activity, do you have any, um, any lift, like a, a tangible metric for how much more people are walking? So yeah, we've Some. been able to show that that people who are wearing our our activity tracker have walked more um, 2,300 2, steps more than the average person would walk in a day. And so um, I think most people know the daily recommended step goal is 10,000 steps, but but we've been able to show a significant increase by 2,300 steps. Do you know what is the average? Do you know? Uh, I believe it's close to around 5,000, but oh. it's, it's almost half of what the recommended is. Hmm. That's great. We'll get to later why those things aren't being handed out by employees. But, uh, <laughs> um, so Rob, you know, I brought this just to tee up an opportunity for you. Um, this is a, a company in Boston called Rest Devices, and it's a little baby shirt that has a sensor that tracks um, Accelerometry, uh, heat, uh, temperature, and I think that's all. I think just those. Oh no, and stretch. Sorry, there's a stretch sensor on the surface of the shirt, but it just it seems so. It seems so big. <laughs> what can you do about this? Sounds like a setup. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm gonna get my watch back before I. Somebody's <laughs> regretting. Um, 
So uh, my name is Rav Sheth. I'm the uh, head of product strategy and market development in the medical sector for a company called MC10. Um, and uh, it's actually it's a, kind of an honor to be here, uh, hosted by Silicon Labs. Thank you guys for having us. Um, our, our whole foundation has been around uh, conformal electronics. And conformal electronics was actually sort of the idea. Was, uh, MC10 is the exclusive licensee around a whole bunch of IP from a professor of material science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, who had this idea years ago at MIT in George Whiteside's lab, I believe, um, to say, I want to put electronics everywhere. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to take silicon, and I'm going to make it really thin, and I'm going to be able to make devices that are uh, not only thin in, in and of themselves, but also be able to connect them in ways that allows uh, sort of almost a complete computer to sort of, or all the devices to, to flex with skin, uh, to make something that's incredibly body conformal. And so that's what MC10 is all about. And over a number of years, um, sort of good news, bad news, a small company, we're actually older than Fitbit. Uh, and they're doing national TV ads, and, and we're not. So um, that's something you know, on the, the good news, bad news side. Um, that said, in the last year, what we've really done is started to establish a set of uh, platforms around which we have a great deal of belief in, um, and now starting to develop partnerships in those areas. Um, they have been predominantly around healthcare. Um, and healthcare is sort of being completely redefined, and I think as the previous dis uh, talk here was already um, sort of sets the stage where what we think of what we can do ourselves, the idea of do-it-yourself healthcare, um, has, is continually expanding. It's happened in the form of information from the, in from the internet, but now it's sort of like what tools do you have at your disposal? There's been wonderful uh, pictures up behind us. But where we see that going is um, with the Affordable Care Act, with the increasing reliance basically upon yourself as an, as an individual to take care of your family's health from a preventive standpoint, um, your, your, yourself and your family's health, that, that uh, the need for better tools and transparency around what you need to know about yourself is only going to increase. It is already increasing. Um, and as we think about what's happened, there was this idea of how is technology going to penetrate healthcare? Um, you know, we, we used to think, oh, this will happen over 10 years or 20 years. We know we need it, but we don't know how that's actually going to materialize. But now, I'm talking about business models, the payment systems are now starting to come into play. So the Affordable Care Act has actually brought in a sense of innovation and a need for innovation uh, around meaningful use. And these may not be terms you guys know, but the, the point is it's being mandated. And so once the government, which is the biggest spender, starts mandating things, you start seeing that, okay, things will in fact change. And we want to be a big part of that. So our three platforms, uh, one is a very breathable sort of sticker tattoo type of thing. It's on my business card. Right there. Oh, excellent. That. So it kind of shows you how small the circuitry can be. But we've had an interesting sort of uh, a high level of interest from folks who are uh, interested in how people interact with their environment. So that's passive. It's got NFC built in with a little bit about limited amount of memory. But that sort of allows you to track yourself through a process which may have nothing to do with healthcare. That could be something as simple as a, a process by which you are going to a very high price entertainment event and you are recognized because of a reader as someone who is a VIP. You might get seat upgrades, you might get special offers, et cetera. And there's a lot of money in that. If anyone's gone to NFL games lately or NBA games, you know the prices only go up and the, uh, the sodas keep getting a little bit more diluted. So, um, and you drink more of them. Uh, into sort of a, a body computer, which I think I left the sample in my bag, so I'm just going to sort of stand up and show it. Um, I've been wearing it for a couple of days now, something that's actually sort of right here. It is, in fact, smaller than the, the onesie that you just saw. So this right here is a, is a device that uh, is, uh, you can see it, I'll show it to you later, but it's about gay by gay. Very thin, conformable. Accelerometer, gyroscope, electrodes to measure biopotential with memory, rechargeable battery, Bluetooth, low energy radio, and a micro on board. Uh, so it's truly a portable computer that senses about your body. And what we've been using that has been in a public partnership with a pharmaceutical company around characterizing movement. That's a pharmaceutical company that specializes in epilepsy and Parkinson's. Um, and they're very interested in knowing, again, this is all about getting information about your life, as, as you put it out, to, as you point out, David. Um, the fact is, just as one example, people who have uh, different kinds of disorders, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, once they've been diagnosed, they see their physician once every six to 12 months. And then because of either distance or disability, you know, their ability to kind of keep making those appointments is, is very, it, it's difficult. Uh, they need a health intermediary or a spouse or an advocate or someone at home. 
So these sorts of devices now can sort of replicate what happens in the office at home. There are companies out there, not to say we're first at this, there are companies out there who already have what's called a 510K, and FDA approval to say, oh, we can measure this kind of thing. The difference is they're not this wearable. They're big, they're thick, they're not gonna follow you through activities of daily living. So what we're very passionate about is taking that idea about that skinny silicon and the circuitry behind it and the intelligence that goes along with it, marrying it with a cloud-based capability and saying, we're gonna give you information about yourself on a more continual basis. And yes, of course, we can in include your physician or we can include your uh, adult child who lives four states away or et cetera. So those are the, the things we're working on there. And then to take it almost one step even beyond, there's the whole concept of microfluidics and doing diagnostics on yourself. And so I think we just had Withings uh, idea around health framework, which is really clever. Um, we started thinking internally about the idea of super vitals. So drugs, you take them, you don't take them. Okay, fine, but what are the things you know you can control that your mother or father has been telling you since you were a child you were supposed to control? It was sleep, diet, and exercise. So this sort of a device can already tell you about sleep and exercise uh, in a very wearable and continuous way, and as we hoped, in a clinically validated way. But the diet piece, now you think about, uh, probably some of you guys have heard of a company called Theranos is working on microfluidics and doing diagnostics. They're not the only one. So we now, through a Gates Foundation grant, have also developed a device that's only about this by this, um, one drop of blood can give you information about a host of uh, different micronutrients in your body. So now, instead of taking the Centrum pill, which now some doctors are now against as well, maybe you just go ahead and check your blood once a month and see what of the things in the Centrum do you actually need. Um, so now you're going from inside the body on, uh, to your behavior, and then finally that interaction with the outside world, which is sort of the spectrum we're operating on. Thank you. Great. Um, so, Chris, you're, you're also coming from this, maybe less from the, the, the need to be wearable and more from the need to just have these things be more ubiquitous in homes. Can you talk a little bit about what you're up to? Uh, sure, absolutely. Oops, there we go. Uh, my name is Chris Otto. I'm the Vice President of Business and Product Development at Mobile Help. And uh, what we do at Mobile Help is we deliver uh, uh, leading uh, mobile personal emergency response systems, or also known as MPERS. So if you're uh, familiar with these uh, safety products, the maybe a pendant that you wear around your neck, you push a button to signal for help. This is the, the same basic category of products that we deliver, uh, but we do it in a mobile fashion so that we get you the help that you need uh, wherever you are, whenever you need it. Uh, we're primarily focused on the elderly, uh, you know, someone that's living independently that might need a medical alert device. Um, we also offer fall detection solutions, um, location tracking. The system uses cellular uh, cellular network and GPS location services to get you the help that you need whenever you need it. Uh, our company is uh, relatively young. Uh, we've been shipping products since 2010, uh, but uh, um, we're currently the leader in mobile emergency response. Uh, the company's been named to the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies in the U.S., uh, uh, Foster and Sullivan uh, Price Leadership Award. Uh, we are, our products save a life every eight minutes. Uh, so uh, we've got some scale to the company now, which is exciting. And uh, so I want to, I guess I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of this category of product called emergency response. And I'll be the first to say that, you know, PERS is not that exciting. It's, it's you know, it's not as exciting as uh, some of the things we're talking about. Uh, but what we're doing and how we're shifting that care paradigm, I, I think is exciting. It's at least uh, something I'm excited about. Um, so PERS is a very basic safety application. It's a single uh, purpose. You push a button, you signal for help. Uh, there's certainly, uh, you know, proof points that demonstrate there are better outcomes with a very basic product like this. Uh, we can get you the help that you need, the survivability rates, and we can get help within the first hour of a fall, for example. Uh, you're six times more likely to survive that episode than if you, if you don't get help. Um, uh, lower costs, shorter stays, so it can be the difference between a, a one-week stay in the hospital versus a, a short trip to the ER. So, um, you know, emergency response certainly uh, is a good product and, and it has good outcomes, but uh, but it's it's a very reactive product. It's uh, so that, you know if, if there were room for criticism, this would be it. Is that it's reactive in nature. Pers is primarily focused on dealing with a catastrophic event and getting you the help when you need it. And um, this space has seen some innovation in the last few years. Uh, most notably, the mobility. Uh, I mentioned the mobile Pers, cellular, and GPS. Uh, also, the automatic fall detection. You know, now rather than having to press a button, uh, which uh, so it happens to be four out of five falls, a senior is unable to press that button. So if you, if you have a fall and you can't press that button, you're not going to get the help you need. Automatic fall detection can get you that. Uh, but still, it's very reactive in nature. So what we're trying to do at Mobile Help and what we have been doing uh, over the past uh, couple years 
is we've been looking uh, at our at the product that we deliver. So we have a core safety application, uh, the product that goes into the user's home. They have a, a base station that goes in the home. They have a wearable pendant that they wear around their neck. Um, and we take that core product that's delivering a safety application, we've looked at horizontal applications that we can uh, deliver over the same platform. So we're very sensitive to how much somebody has to wear, uh, especially, especially if it's a, a, you know, another wearable device, um, unless it is ubiquitous in their clothing. Uh, but in this case, we want to minimize what they have to wear, minimize the number of boxes that go in the user's home. So we take this basic base station and appendant that they wear, what applications can we deliver that add value to that user that needs it most? And uh, the applications that, we've, that we've, we've added to that system are medication reminders. Um, if you are managing multiple, multiple medications, you're three times more likely to have a fall. Uh, well, guess what? The average, our average user, the average senior, is managing three to seven medications. Uh, so we take that base station. Uh, you can add your medications via the web, and then it announces it's time to take your medication. You can acknowledge that uh, with a button on the device and, and uh, uh, reduce errors and, and improve uh, compliance. Uh, the second application that we looked at was activity tracking. So we have a wearable pendant that is designed to automatically detect falls and signal for help. Well, uh, it so happens that a fear of falling is a, is a especially among our age group uh, that we're serving, is a very, um, uh, it, it actually changes behavior to the negative. If you're afraid of falling, you're, you become more uh, less active, more uh, immobile. You spend more time on the couch because you're afraid to get up and walk. You don't want to run the risk of falling, but that's actually counterintuitive. It, it has the opposite effect. The, as soon as you become less active, your risk of falling increases. And so, you know, if someone that's afraid of falling, they get less active, they are more likely to fall. Uh, so we've uh, embedded activity tracking in the same product that is being used to deliver emergency response for falls can now promote a healthy active lifestyle, tracking activity, you can track that uh, in some of the ways, some of the other activity tracking devices. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. And, uh, and the, third, uh, the third thing that we've done is we've taken the base station, uh, which has Bluetooth capability, and we've combined off-the-shelf devices like a weight scale, uh, blood pressure cuff, um, glucometer, and uh, we're doing that to manage chronic diseases. Uh, so the average senior, our average user is managing, is dealing with two chronic diseases. So this is a natural complement uh, to the core safety product, and uh, we're, we're focusing that mostly on somebody that's had a prescribed home health care episode where they may have participated in a remote monitoring application, and now they've been discharged. They've grown comfortable to monitoring uh, uh, you know, biometrics, and now they're losing that. So this is kind of a step-down, uh, lightweight uh, application that they can combine with their safety product, and, and uh, um, we're delivering that as well. So, so those are some of the things we're excited about, trying to shift the care paradigm from a reactive, uh, emergency-focused application to one that's proactive, that's designed to help seniors stay active, healthy, and well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. I want to ask you later about um, sort of who pays and how much people pay and what the distribution channel is, but let's wait first. Um, uh, so Dennis, you're in the business of, of uh, facilitating and enabling all these, all these, uh, all these solutions. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, about um, sort of the ones that you're most enthusiastic about? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, well, thank you. My name's Dennis Natal. I head up uh, um, business development for the IoT here at Silicon Labs. We've been doing this for a long time. We're actually bringing the technologies, the communications that will allow all these application and devices to come to life. We've been doing this for many years, um, looking to establish the applications, the business models, the channels, the ecosystem, the technologies. And over the last several years, we've been, I think, pretty successful. I believe that in the IoT, we see a lot of momentum today, probably the most we've ever seen. But I think specifically in the connected home, it's been um, very, very successful. We've seen this started out at the basic coffee table where we had multiple remote controls and we wanted one. And we've seen that grown to lighting controls, concentric circles moving out. We've seen that with um, temperature control. We've, we've seen that with other applications in your home. And we've seen that with uh, high net worth homes and now it's being pushed out into do it yourself. We've seen uh, the, the use of security as a core application to get people started into their homes where you could have a pay for service with security devices, the on off switches, open close, cameras, passive infrared. And these are becoming very pervasive in people's homes, whether it's pay for service or if it's a do it yourself. 
Lighting control as a way to enter your home is becoming a very big application. It's a way that people want to get started with connected devices and grow into other applications in their home and then you add on AV control, you add on temperature control. My point being there's a lot of ways to enter the home to become a consumer of connected devices. Um, we believe that the um, home health care is the next wave of applications and we believe that what we've established already in the home is going to facilitate that. We hear a lot about, well, there's confusion about technologies, there's, we don't understand what to do. Our point of view here at Silicon Labs is that you want to use the right protocols, the right technologies for the right application in your home. It starts out with a big pipe into your house. You need connectivity to the internet and Wi-Fi is pervasive and needs to be there. You want to move video across your home, Wi-Fi is going to be there and you need to utilize it. But we also believe that there's a lot of connected devices that don't require that bandwidth, that are constrained, that need uh, battery power, and that that's the best use for mesh networking. Today, Zigbee is the top mesh networking protocol out there. The future is going to be an IP-based mesh networking technology called Thread. And Silicon Labs is very proud to be a leader in both of those areas. And finally, we believe that point-to-point -point is a critical aspect to your home network. And Bluetooth and r for ce are going to be critical to that. Bluetooth, uh, because it is pervasive in your handsets, is going to open up a lot of opportunities, a lot of applications for commissioning these many devices, but also for tracking you through your home. And Silicon Labs is very excited to be supporting all of those. So when we talk about um, home health care, we believe that the technology is out there, that we've established networks that are already active in your security system, your do-it-yourself automation, and that we encourage the device manufacturers, the, the um, service providers, the inventors to join into those connected uh, systems that we already have and innovate and bring new business models and service models for healthcare. And we've heard about uh, three of them today and there's many more. Thank you. So I wanna jump right into this question about business models, like who should pay for IoT health solutions? Um, I think when we, when we did this product, we wanted the pharma companies to pay, but it was tough because you'd go and talk to the brand manager at the pharma company and say, we can make you 30% more revenue, and they'd say, well, tell me about this distribution deal you have with the pharmacy benefit network. And we'd say, oh, well, I guess we have to go get a distribution deal with a pharmacy benefit network. So um, how, what have you seen in terms of self-pay versus subsidized models versus hybrids and what will, like, what will make these things scale so that it's like wear strips on Gillette razor blades or wear strips on brawn toothbrushes, you know, just sort of becomes standard and in the ether. Well, from our perspective, we've seen um, subscription-based security all the way down to freemium that you've heard people say about where you just get a, a gateway and you're going to connect devices. The reality is there is a service being provided no matter where you pay for it. We've seen different customers uh, amortize that in different ways through an IT budget or through a, pay, uh, pay, a fee for service. So it really comes down to what the business model of the particular activity is. If you're vertically integrated, you may be able to uh, collect revenues through selling devices. If you're just a base platform, you probably have a monthly subscription fee, and it all depends on the value that you're providing the consumer. But where, I guess, where's the fast-moving part of the glacier? Like, like, where do you see large adoption happening, maybe for home security? Is it through Verizon? Is it being sold as a bundled service through the telco? Is that, is that, where, the, is that where you're seeing the, the most flow of, of adoption? Um, it, it, by no doubt that, that the home security through the service providers, through uh, core security companies, is, is, is flowing very well, and mm -hmm. there's a very large and growing business there. Mm -hmm. But we also do see that uh, do-it-yourself models through um, basic retailers uh, is also thriving. Hmm. Chris, how about you? What, do you? what are you seeing in terms of the, the distribution path, and what, where's, the, where's the volume coming from? So the uh, for the emergency response, the, our business model is a recurring monthly subscription, so it's a, uh, about $35 a month for the service. It's, uh, uh, it's all private pay today. So everything that we're mm -hmm. doing, we, we, uh, there are companies in the space that are uh, you know, using other retail channels, but, but we're strictly direct to consumer. It's mm -hmm. all private pay. Um, you talk about glaciers and, and you know, reimbursements and, and things like that. It's, uh, uh, it's been very slow, uh, and uh, even though there's you know, proof of efficacy, there's, there's no payment strategies in place. The exception would be uh, 
state by state for Medicaid. There, there are some Medicaid waivers in place to pay for some of the programs, but it's um, usually at a deeply discounted uh, mm. uh, price point and um, you know, state by state, so it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to, uh, to gain that access for the, the typical consumers. And who's the product being recommended by? Like, is, is the cost of sales less because you can work with a hospital or, some, or another party to recommend the product? Yeah, so the, the, I mean, the typical safety product like this is, is, uh, is sold you know, following some event. So there's been a hospitalization or a discharge. Mm -hmm. So discharge planners in the hospital or home health care agencies are often recommending this category of product, but, um, but there's, it, it's still private pay. Hmm. Can you spiff the doc for recommending? Um, with this, uh, Just you know, asking. We, yeah. I don't know. Maybe everybody already knows this. <laughs> you no, know, we've, we've now yeah, you can't really. There's uh, especially you know when there's nonprofits involved, it's it's difficult to do that. So mm. um, so we're not doing that right now. It's too bad. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about have you have you seen models for you know employer subsidization? So so for us, there's there's two pieces. There's the data piece, and then there's the device piece. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, ideally. We hope that at one point the devices would be subsidized by insurance. Um, right now the way that, I mean, we sell direct to consumer, but we also sell um, to hospitals and um, you know, larger healthcare providers as well as um, employers. So we have um, a full service employee wellness program where you know, unlike some other platforms that are out there, we provide the entire back end um, and all of the devices. So it makes it much more simple for the employer or the benefits manager or the HR manager to actually see the ROI of what they're implementing. Um, but from a data side, I, we're starting to see uh, large, um, large providers and large um, EMR providers like Epic um, and Cerner to see where they can take the data from all of these devices because we actually see that there's an uptake of patients that are going to their doctors uh, and that's where that's where the loop kind of circles back. We have doctors coming to us because they have patients going to them saying, I'm using a Withings blood pressure monitor. Like, how can this be incorporated into my care plan? And we're starting to see more on an individual basis with um, certain providers how we can use the data uh, directly into their current medical practice. And I think... Uh, you know, with Apple Health, we're going to see that more and more, and I think that's going to really be how we can uh, start to, you know, really flip this funnel and try and um, push the data through to the current healthcare system. So, if you were to predict in three or four years, do you think most of the volume is going to be is most of the volume in your business will come through some sort of subsidized model where Bank of America is saying it's. 50% off you, any Withings product, and so, you know, encouraging uh, people to Three or four out. years might be a little bit ambitious. I, I know that medicine moves a lot slower than that. Um, it would be ideal, but uh, I, I would say in the next 10 years that that's where I see hmm. the sales of devices. Have you seen any retail partnerships where you can get a discount from your employer, take it to Best Buy, and then fulfill? Like couponing right now, programs? No? Right now, we work directly with the employers. Um, there hasn't been a drive towards a retail. Uh -huh. a so no fulfillment entity. through a no. known retailer. Huh. You should do that. <laughs> <laughs> and do you want to talk about pay payments? Sort of, who, is it self, employer, insurer, pharma, other, hybrid? Yeah, I think... Um, what we see, I think what's, what's exciting, so it's complex but yet exciting, is that we actually, I think we can extract value at, uh, at multiple segments. So uh, the example I gave earlier about a movement disorder patient, and if you're able to track them more, there's a, a few different things going on all at the same time. One is, uh, there was a discussion earlier about the pharmaceutical, I think it was your example, mm -hmm. regarding if they start taking a drug more, more continuously, they stand to benefit. Um, so. So you've actually got the pharma uh, company, um, could be all of med device as well. You've got the payers as well, and you've got the patients and the patient's family and care providers all at the same time. And what we found is that there's almost three different value streams. One is um, just a sense of security and a better uh, level of engagement and empowerment about your own condition, which 
uh, these folks already have. Some of the most passionate um, users of these sorts of technologies are folks who are living with long-term chronic diseases, such as multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's. They're, they're very willing to try new technologies, um, and, and in some cases willing to pay for them, up to a point. Um, then you have this idea of uh, greater numbers of intervention possibilities. So if you have more information, your physician's aware of it, then there may be more trends you can spot and now you're not waiting for someone to tell you something uh, just because of a phone call or an emergency room visit or the next well visit when you finally tease out that actually things haven't been that great. Um, in those situations, when you have great, uh, better outcomes, that's the insurance provider ultimately who's gonna be able to sign off on those. And then finally, you have sort of the entire area of just clinical trial research as well. So now you have pharmaceutical companies who are interested themselves in saying, I can get new therapies to market faster with new endpoints. That's a different part of the pharmacy, uh, sort of the pharmaceutical um, budget, but they do spend a ton of money and that is in the billions and hundreds of billions. So these are all sort of very large markets that we would aim to go after, but it ends up being for us sort of a level of maturity and penetration in each of those markets. Where does the adoption happen first and what is that sort of segment willing to pay? Um, historically, if it's going to cost over a hundred bucks, you know, and if it's not something you're going to be easily able to find in Walgreens, a lot of Americans believe they shouldn't be paying for it. FSA notwithstanding, that should be something your health insurance company is paying for. And so I think what's really important to us is to make sure that we sort of uh, siphon off sort of the right levels of value at the right uh, segments of the value chain. Nice. I want to ask one more question before opening it up to you, which is what is the biggest in your business today, if you had a magic wand, what's the biggest barrier to adoption and growth that you sort of fret about that keeps you up at night? I'll give you a multiple choice if you care. If, like, is, it, is it retail distribution? Is it awareness, sort of mar like marketing the product? Is it the user experience and making it simple and something that, that isn't confound people? Is it the battery life so that people don't have to take care of these things? Is it the form factor so it looks fashionable? Is it something else? that somebody in this room can help with, you know? <laughs> like, what's, the, what's, what's, what's keeping you back? Uh, I'll take a stab at that. Yeah. So, um, so in our case, uh, I'll, I'll say the, you know, probably the, uh, the form factor and the, the fashion component may actually be, you know, peripherally related. So we have a pendant that you wear around your neck, and, and uh, for some, there's a stigma of aging attached to that. It's, right. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like the hearing aid. The average person that needs a hearing aid will take seven years before they need one, before they'll actually hmm. start using one. And, hmm. and uh, the same is true for the, the category of product that, that we offer. Hmm. So we, in the U.S., there's about two million people that are using a pendant, a purse product. Hmm. Um, but last year, about 13 million seniors had a fall that, that symptoms of the hospital. So it's, uh, you know, there's definitely uh, an underserved uh, uh, population. Uh, I would say cost is, is some of that, but probably the, the, uh, the bigger, uh, the, the bigger barrier would be uh, the stigma associated with it. So um, before the panel, we were talking about fashion. Uh, one of the biggest requests that we have, and we do offer it, is a uh, pendant that has a, a beaded lanyard. It's very simple. It's, it's a, you know, it's like a dollar lanyard that goes with it, probably less than that. But it's, a, you know, just, it makes a little pendant look a little bit like jewelry, and, and especially with, obviously with females, it's very popular, and it makes uh, a little more uh, tolerable to wear this device, so I, I think there's. You need uh, like a Mickey Moto, Mickey. Who are the what's the pearl <laughs> company that's crazy expensive? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think there's, uh, you know, unfortunately, style is also very personal. So to make a you know a mass consumer product that right, that's, right. you know fits fits uh, all sizes is difficult. But hmm. I think there's certainly some room for improvement in, in what we offer. Hmm. Thanks. What do you think? So from Withings perspective, I, I'd probably go with brand awareness. I, I think there's, I mean, not only is there a lot of competition in the space that really has exponentially grown in the past two, three, four, or five years, um, but it, it's really an understanding of what does connected healthcare mean. I think that we're kind of inventing this space that for me, I like to describe it as, you know, not the medical device space, not the connected fitness space, but it's really a new space. So not only are you introducing new devices and new applications, but you're, you're, you have to educate people as to what are they actually buying into. Um, but there are a lot of companies that can be seen as direct competitors to us uh, that 
do kind of focus on a specific fitness goal or maybe a medical device. And uh, it, it's really about being able to tie together those five pillars of health that is the core of our business uh, and the design and the elegance and, and bringing that to a mass market. Do you know how many people wear fitness trackers? Like, uh, is it worldwide? 10, it, in the US, is it like 10%? How many people in the room have a fitness tracker on? So I think having one two percent. OK. Right, yeah. yeah. Huh. I mean, I guess the, the interesting strategy question is, after April 30th, is that we'll good? Change. Or is that, I mean, is, is, yeah. the, is, is the, the marketing muscle that Apple brings to the watch, does, does that sell more withings? activities yeah, I, or does that cannibalize you? I absolutely think so. I, I think that Apple I think right. is <laughs> I think that <laughs> Apple is free advertising for this entire industry. It's it's creating awareness for a space that is primarily early adopters to this point. I mean, you, you think that it's growing and growing, but it's really growing amongst a small percentage and number of users mm. that are kind of secular to the people we're all hanging out with. Uh, so, so I absolutely see Apple as helping Withings, helping you know all the other brands that are selling because, I mean, especially because of the price point. I mean, we're you're going to find people that aren't going to spend three hundred fifty dollars, and they're still going to be spending between the fifty to one hundred fifty dollar range for um, what they want to get out of it. So, I absolutely see it as a plus. I think one of the one of the interesting sort of dichotomies or catch twenty twos about this watch versus the Nike Fuel Band or the Jawbone Up that I wore be beforehand is that everyone would ask me about those, right? They'd say like, "What's the thi what's that thing on your wrist? Like, what is that tracking?" Because it just looked it looked novel and bizarre, and 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 no one ever asks me about this because it's right. sort of it's so camouflaged that it doesn't become a talking point. Which is one of the reasons I like it, but it's also a downer, I think, for like if you're trying to make a conversational right, topic out of to out of a product, if you're a marketing a person. But but um, I, we don't even call it a smartwatch; we just call it a watch, and either a watch that is smart or just this is a watch because that's what it is. I mean, it's not it's not anything besides what just a watch will be from now on. Hmm. So, Rob, how can the room help you with your biggest barrier to adoption? Oh, what, do, what do you need? Yeah, no, so for us, it's actually, I think, about proof more than anything. Um, I think we, we've had from the beginning a sense of uh, wanting to show that a consumer sensibility with a highly validated, sort of very technical device can, can coexist. Um, so what we're actually very much about right now is proving that the sorts of data streams that um, can be created, in fact, will be created, and they'll be, that they'll be meaningful. Um, we've, we've focused very much on, I think, in our world, uh, livers, livers and winners and so the winners were like sort of the initial quantified self folks people who live in san francisco jog a lot they do they do triathlons and then sort of ultimately um that's like x percent of the population that's like less than one percent um but then the livers the folks who have something they're very concerned about which is not just a movement disorder but it might be diabetes it might be something else those folks are willing to spend money but they don't to your point i think to the points that are being made they don't want to shout out about it they don't want as i read a quote somewhere oh, this thing shows that I'm old and out of control. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, and so they're looking for discretion. They're looking for knowledge and discretion together. And I think we can provide that. What MC10 is very much in the process of doing is very big, I think, in 2015 with, through partnerships and through our own studies is actually to start to prove out that um, maybe our device platform could sort of be the next generation of what, what Withings does. They're, they're very you know, specific functions now. Um, when you fast forward this over several years, you're going to be providing more and more complex information to the hands of the people who are, in fact, more and more the ones actually paying for it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I see happening in our world. So if you guys know a lot about, you know, physicians who do clinical trials and that kind of thing, that's us. That's what you need. <laughs> Great. Um, what questions do you have? We have so David, a, can, we I, have a, can I jump in there? Yeah, quick? yeah, please. So one of the, <clears throat> so we believe that for the connected home and healthcare, that one of the lowest barriers to entry would be aging in place. We feel that aging in place, that many the technology exists, many of the devices exist today. Um, so we're looking for, for uh, pioneers that want to go out and take these business models and bring them to the people. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, what we hear when we talk to service providers in general, their biggest, their number one need from us is more devices. They're, 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 there's a, a pull 
from all the retailers, from the service providers, I won't be specific, but in general, they're asked, looking for better devices and more devices. Hmm. That means smaller, cheaper, uh, multifunctioned, combining functionality. If it's a on-off switch, let's put temperature humidity in. They're looking for these to have better user interface, uh, better design, blending in some of the concepts you talked about. Mm -hmm. So um, my request, my challenge to the organization is let's, let's move forward with these business models and let's bring more devices to market because there is a pull and a need. Great. Questions or things you're excited about and want to share? Yeah, you first and then, and then ma'am, you next. Hmm. Because that's got to matter. I mean, you guys are measuring the body as a black box and what it's doing, what we see here, but I think you got to measure the inputs. So I'll, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll jump I don't in. know if it was aimed at me, but I'll maybe take a stab. Uh, two, two things. I, I want to as well, so go ahead. Uh, two things. <laughs> One is um, when we say what, what's the most pervasive, what's the biggest thing, um, there's sort of a sense of what, 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 are, what are the biggest drivers of cost, and then that might be different from what people actually have control over. I'll just go to sleep. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> sleep shows up not only very high in the thing, I think there was a statistic once, maybe 100 million people in America alone are concerned about how they sleep. It felt like an exaggeration, but then I was like, I'm, I'm one for one. I, I don't think it works right for me. And then when I go down to the uh, liver population, um, the, the sleep shows up in every movement disorder. It's not only its own disease, it's also a contributing factor to cardiovascular disease and, a con and something that has a feedback loop into multiple of the sort of chronic diseases, folks who have Parkinson's, folks who have multiple sclerosis, where they don't sleep well, they don't feel as well the next day, um, or they are more likely to sort of, sort of feel not at their best. And so sleep just as a general category I think is, is, is really important, maybe, to the, the, maybe my first answer to your first question. And then the second piece around the inputs, that is an area I think you guys are very involved. Uh, I think we, we are very, what are the closed loop systems within which we can monitor what you're doing versus what that output look, looks like and then drive that into the behavior change? That for us also shows up because what's really interesting for us is that aging in place population, you take Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, some of these, it's already proven now, right? And, and maybe some of you, even in the common mainstream media are seeing, if you exercise, it can provide a neuroprotective effect on folks with Parkinson's. If you take ballroom dancing, these sort of like complex behaviors, coordination, um, you know, it used to be sort of like people made fun of that kind of thing. Nobody does anymore. So the fact is, the more you do this to try to maintain sort of a particular kind of lifestyle, that will absolutely delay, and these are the things I'm referencing, these things have been published in journals like neurology. This isn't sort of, you know, uh, crank science. So um, I, I think it's something we're very involved in, and it involves essentially this communication of information, Dennis, to your point. We've got to take that, that we're gathering these better inputs, put them through the right sort of user interface, and then spit that back at the people and the folks around them who are best to, uh, able to, to benefit from them. And that's something that's very important to us. So, you know, to your point of what is the one thing that we're focusing on? I mean, we're focusing on prevention, and I, I had put together some slides, but basically it shows how our devices are helping to be an early indicator um, for any a number of different types of conditions, whether it's um, you know, sleep apnea in regards to sleep, whether it's hypertension, whether it's obesity or cardiovascular risk. So I think there's, um, a huge movement towards just how do we focus people towards the prevention space of healthcare as opposed to um, being reactive to the medical system. And um, you know, to your second point of of what are we feeding in? Um, you know, I we we create devices that track a lot of data. We have a ton of data, whether it ranges from activity levels to blood pressure, heart rate, weight, body fat, but the, 
the piece of it that's most important is the improvement piece. So it's the leaderboard that we create on our application that provides the um, social incentives and the way that people, um, thank you. Voila. <laughs> uh, the way that people can interact with others because we've found that those that use the leaderboard, those that have peers that they're competing with are taking more steps. And those that are tweeting their weight are actually more um, susceptible to helping them to lose weight. Uh, and with sleep, those that are tracking their sleep are actually better at understanding what they need to do in order to help them to improve upon their sleep. So it, it's really not just the data that we're collecting, but the other pieces that we're doing to help people understand that. Just to add on, I, I, I was gonna say sleep and stress. I'm really intrigued with, with what can you do if you know someone's stress and what little changes can you make throughout the day in order to ameliorate something. You had a question too. I'm going to throw that to Dennis. What are you seeing in terms of security and the sort of need, the need for like encryption at the chip level? So uh, at the chip level, it all depends on where the vulnerability is coming from. At, at the chip level, the device level, your home network, or in the cloud. And what we're doing to protect our devices it, through encryption is, is been proven to be pretty good. What we're seeing is if you have a physical attack on a device and you break into it, there's a lot of things that that can go wrong, but really I think where most of the concern is, is at the cloud level. I think stealing from large data centers and such is where most of the focus has been, and that's where we need to make sure we protect data. Yeah, I would agree completely. I, I don't think there's a lot of risk that somebody's, you know, gonna sit outside your house and try to steal your blood pressure reading, you know, for the day. I mean, that's relatively low risk, but, but uh, you know, HIPAA. Unless you're Hillary Clinton or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> true, true celebrities, maybe, but uh, um, yeah, the cloud, cloud-based security is, is the concern. You had a question, ma'am, and then you did. Ariel. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely <laughs> correct that there, there aren't a lot of rules in place about this, uh, and you know, we we feel that we want to be the ones at the forefront to incorporate privacy and security um, and make that really known to our users. I mean, I can say for certain that as a company, we're really. Um, you know, we want to be able to share with people that the data is theirs. And so, you know, we don't ever, we will never sell our users data. We will never share it with others unless there's permissions. Um, and, and that's something, you know, we make really clear to our users. Um, but, but I think that, that there is um, still a lot to be done in this space in terms of, um, you know, the, the HIPAA regulation, like what you're saying. But it, it I mean, to be perfectly honest, it actually, because there is no regulation with HIPAA, it's difficult for us to even get involved in anything. So it actually, there is a lot of protection in the space because, because it's not regulated by HIPAA, we have a lot of trouble to even start working in the healthcare space um, because that is so strongly regulated. Is there, what about her second question about um, the, the potential of an employer sharing data, even anonymized data, with, with an insurer? Or is that where you draw the line between PII and anonymized? Right. I mean, I, I, there, 
there definitely, you know, there could maybe be more of a fine line drawn about what, you know, defines uh, aggregated and anonymized data, but that's really, I, I mean, maybe that's where the, the disconnect might come. I mean, we're really strict about using, you know, specific uh, standardized standardization with our data in terms of quantifying it as anonymized or aggregated. Uh, and, and I mean, we will enforce that upon anyone that, you know, we work with that would use the Withings data as well. Thanks. You had a question, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, what about analytic you know, competition? Uh, is there an application? Uh, you know, talked about where uh, you think sports teams you know, will be do these kinds of things, you know, run better on the data? Yeah, Rob has an, a, a sports example, right? Yeah, you know, we, we actually did go, I, mean, I think you were talking about performance enhancement, actually, specifically, as opposed to safety. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. The question? Yeah. There is, uh, so back to that sort of livers and winners, the absolutely the winners was where um, I think the Nikes, Adidas, uh, Under Armour, um, there's a lot of examples. I think some are here at South By as well um, that folks have put some in attention and money into it. Some of those have, effect, uh, have approached us. We've talked about, uh, I can't say with whom, but talked about hydration sensing, so not just how much you've lost, but what exactly you've lost. Should I be drinking Gatorade or should I be drinking water? You know, so we've, we've definitely been involved in that from a technology standpoint, but um, the reality is, uh, that space actually is, there's a lot of folks in that space. There's a lot of money there to kind of eke out sort of one-tenth of one percent extra performance out of a professional athlete. At the high school level, I think we've had uh, almost like a cautionary tale where there was a lot of focus on concussions, head, uh, head impacts. We actually launched a product called the Checklight in conjunction with another company um, that was focused on head impact sensing because the FDA, we could obviously not and did not do the testing, therefore, to call it a concussion monitor per se, but it could measure an amount of energy that was impacted to, uh, imparted to the head. Um, if you don't have standards to work with, and if you don't kind of manage that at the grassroots level, then it's likely to be doomed to failure. You don't, you know, on that, one kid on a high school team can't have access to a technology that might be, you know, potentially safe. So um, that is something I think it's almost like a market adoption sort of exercise waiting to happen from a safety perspective. Um, but there is definitely a lot of attention there, and that attention, because people have been scared about entering into the medical realm, I think that's actually taken off even, you know, quicker. Um, yeah, it seems like in the self-pay field, like we're seeing golf clubs, tennis rackets, like almost any piece of for sports equipment that could be have a measurement on it that would hope to help you learn how to have a better backhand or whatever. There's a lot, seems to be a lot, a lot of investment going in A lot in of there. money in professional sports, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <We're laughs> any other Texas, questions? So. You had a question and then you, sir. Go ahead. Right, so the, the, the hurdle for proving eth efficacy is a, is, a high, is a high one. Yes, right, yeah, the path to market is much more complex. Yeah, I mean, my, obs my observation is companies like Withings and Jawbone and Fitbit are taking a self-pay model for exactly that reason. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I could uh, take a, a shot yeah. at that. Actually, we, we feel that um, it, you, you're talking about connected lighting. Is that what your question started about? I actually think that you have a, a great position in the home, that you have an asset in the home that's fixed, that's going to be in the same place, and potentially is always powered. And what does that mean? That you can now put other types of uh, functionality into your device, and we have Silicon Labs 
can help you with that, around indoor air quality, around um, occupancy sensing, around temperature sensing, humidity sensing. These are all factors that affect your health. We've talked a lot about um, medical care. We've talked about um, um, athletics. Health care can actually be much simpler than that. It's really, is your environment appropriate, and is it uh, for your aging in place, for your children and others, and all those things fa factor in. So I think basic devices, by adding functionality, um, can make them more valuable. I just wanted to project for you, this is a, a Indiegogo campaign that sort of has a, a light bulb that has a, a brain, and the diff you can put different functionality and sort of swap that in. But the sort of the, the great part about the light bulb is, is the Edison mount. You know, we sort of get that architecture and all of us feel empowered to install them. Yeah. <laughs> um, who else? Somebody, I, yeah, you had a question and then you. Yeah, I was going to ask you to, to uh, answer your uh, uh, last question yourself uh, and uh, provide an assessment of why uh, the low cap hasn't uh, been adopted more widely. Uh, it has, I think, more to do with the, the, um, uh, the mistakes of the investor, the, the, the mistakes of the, the acquiring company rather than the market readiness of the product. But I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> well, well said. <laughs> you had a question, yeah. yeah. Right, so how, how does the, the network of all of these objects either work together or work together in? Right, that's a great question. Who's, who's, who wants to, who's excited about answering well, that? Uh, I, I mean, I, I can give a good example. I just told someone this earlier. So, um, you know, so I went to go watch the Apple Watch announcement on Monday and I signed on initially using Google Chrome and that was a mistake because Apple didn't stream using Google Chrome, so I had to switch to Safari. And a lot of people have started talking about this because a lot of people encountered that. And it's the issue that, you know, Apple or Google, Google which owns Nest, you know, the products that are used to control your temperature, control your smoke detectors, um, they are in a really great position because of their mass marketability to own the connected home. But they aren't open, they aren't open platforms to everybody. Uh, so, I mean, I think, that's, I think that's a really interesting question to explore and it's gonna be the, it's gonna be the company which is completely open uh, that I think will win the game in terms of being the hub of the connected home. And there are, if, if we believe the premise that the, the structure and backbone of connected homes are, are actually being put in place as we speak, and uh, perhaps it's your, your, your platform, then it, it really comes out to, do you want to focus on those particular use cases or those particular business models? And, and once you do, the scenes, the devices, the revenue streams, the partnerships, whether it's in the home, in the cloud, how you're going to push it down will, will become pretty obvious. So my, really, my, my challenge to the group here is I think that all the ingredients are in place to create uh, to, for the beginning of home health care. And it's going to be the platform providers, the data sources, working with the uh, device manufacturers that exist already, the, the bulbs that are smart, to bring that to the consumer. And then over time, we're going to lay in probably some of the more uh, sophisticated uh, models of, of wearables and others. But right now, I mean, the connectivity, the, the, back, the back office systems, they exist. It's, it's, uh, it's got to be purposeful and deliberate. I just wanted to, um, how many people have tried uh, or are users of If This Then That? Good. I thought this would be a savvy audience of this. So I've, uh, I've sort of coerced If This Then That to be a healthcare object for my company, for my, for my home. So I have my... My, my living room glows sort of groovy, uh, purple, like, you know, like um, Virgin Airlines if I get 10K steps back when I was using uh, Jawbone. 
Um, so it was nice because then you could sort of, you can cobble together these rules that have, you know, something to do with behavior and something to do with representation of data, you know, and it's a very ad hoc thing. Are you working on something similar to IFT? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Great. What is it called? Wink? Nice. Great. Check it out. Oh, the hub is there. Gotcha. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I think it's an interesting it's an interesting role in the ecosystem to have to be sort of interstitial, you know, connective tissue to, you know, between between objects and data. Um, nice. Any other questions? Let's take one, let's take one more. Yeah. A question. Uh, when the whole concept of wearable biometric devices first kind of had its genesis, yep. you know, I guess uh, at least to the public, it, from a consumer standpoint, in the mid 2000s, okay, the, what all means up, the big face of it all, was that you had these devices and the AD and D and invisible, which is probably what you're already wearing. And then also, um, they would tell you something interesting about yourself that would make you want to keep wearing it. Idea was that somewhere in the cool, I don't think it was really called the cloud at the time because you know that was a cool word that came out later. But the idea is what you would have, uh, you know, what we call now the cloud would have some processing and crunch all that data to say something interesting about you that would make you keep wanting to wear this invisible device. Mm. You, you and you and all different, right? And but it, it hasn't happened. Um, maybe Jawbone was the first kind of to try and get it publicly with their inside engine, but you know, the insight you get is uh, well, every time you fly a plane. So what you're describing is sort of an AI that looks at all of the combinations of all of these inputs, all these data streams, and says like really new insights about, you know. Mm -hmm. you know, something, you know, at least conceptually that simple, but harder to implement, I get. But in principle, the things that are measured now, you should be able to make those correlations. They haven't been at least implemented in any, you know, massive way or wherever. Yeah, what do you guys, what do you guys say? You, you just told me before that you've, you've hired 30 engineers that are just working on the software in the cloud, so they must be working on this, right? Well, absolutely. These sort of combinatorial <laughs> insights. Um, so <laughs> I think it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a great question, and I think it sort of says where we are today. If you actually backed up 10 years ago, if, if that was actually the metric, and thought about connectivity, bandwidth, the level of technology that Withings was at, that we were at, um, it's just a completely different world. Uh, so I would say now we're at the point of actually fulfilling the promise that you're, you're identifying. And I think it's funny, aging in place, you know, Philips Lifeline's been around for how long? 25, I, I don't know, I actually don't know. They're up by me in Boston. 20 years, right? So um, I think it's longer, actually. But, but uh, so that's the one I'm thinking of because they were up there also, and they're one of my one of my neighbors. Actually, used to be in the original company. So last week, coming Life, in Lifeline. as we as they're we hired, exactly yeah. Philips Life. So the um, last week we had a, a firmware engineer come in and interview with us at MC10 because we have openings because we're hiring, and uh, the guy used to work there, and apparently. They're laying everybody off who's not tied to, I think, just mobile only. And I think you would know more about this than I would. But it was, it was news to me. And so how long have we been saying aging in place should have been a great business model? And the reality is the technology about just putting fixed things in your home that couldn't track you outside of the house, wasn't easy to use, didn't do the right things, all the things I think he's going to try and fix or maybe is already fixing, that's, that's what we had 10 years ago. So just because you know, it's the, the, the most powerful thing is the right idea whose time has come, the, the idea about the timing has included the technology and the, and the computational power. I, I mean, we, we weren't, I mean, I say, hey, just be self, uh, self-referential here, but we didn't, we weren't able to do this 10 years ago. I don't think anybody was. I'm quite confident nobody was. It's RIP, heck. So, um, so I think right now, though, I was at an earlier talk today about how, um, startups in healthcare are being funded and the amount of money that's going into digital health, if you look at the, the curves there, it's incredible. I think there was like a 150% increase in venture capital investments in digital health from 2013 to 2014. 
And the track just going first year to date results on 2015 alone look like that that's going. So I think we've had these problems for that long and even longer. But I think our readiness to be able to solve them in a meaningful way, I think, is, has actually arrived in a much more recent way. That's, at least that's something I'd pass over to you guys. So uh, just as a, maybe just as a last word, it seems like you're in the position of actually aggregating sleep data and activity data and maybe stress data if you're doing heart rate variability. And you know, are you starting to see cascades where you know, you've been on an international flight and then you haven't slept well and then you're binge eating and then your weight goes up and then you're stressed? You know, have you, are you starting to see these sort of behavioral cascades? Well, I mean, I was, I was just going to make the comment that it, I mean, it may seem really obvious, but think about the behavior change that we've made up to this point just by, just by the tracking part of it. So just by looking down at your watch and knowing, okay, I've only reached half my step goal, like that in and of itself is a really strong behavior change model. Same with sleep, same with blood pressure. Um, so, you know, completely agreed that I, I think from now we can start to aggregate the data, at least for my company, which has been around now for five years. So, you know, there's now there's a mass of data, which seems to make sense that we can kind of tie that all together. But I think that we have made strides. I think that there is a significant behavior change that has come just from the, the data itself. Great. Okay. Last words, Dennis. Sorry. <laughs> So from a perspective, is the, uh, providing the technologies that go into these devices, what we've seen is many OEMs being best of breed in solving a problem, gathering data, but holding on to it. And not all OEMs, not all devices can solve all the use. Put it all, it, it all needs to be put together to answer, to solve your problem. And if we don't share information, I mean, it goes against the question that what came in the back about privacy, about security. So th there, there are some hurdles to over overcome, but a common user interface that solves use cases that you defined are going to come from multiple centers, multiple sources, and maybe multiple platforms. And are we all going to share that data so that we can bring you the information you're asking for? That's the question. And that goes across how do you make your money, proprietary lines, why would I open up my data? But that's, the, that's where we're heading towards. Please help me in thanking the panelists for all their great ideas. Nice.